All right, we're live. Welcome to Dive into World Building. And um, I have my label back, which makes me happy. That means Google fixed their software. <laughs> and and today we're talking about uh, temperature control, which is a very helpful thing. Like, you know, uh, we were just brainstorming a little bit before the Hangout started. And oh my goodness, there's a lot here. Um, clothes, uh, heating oil programs, uh, homes and how they're built uh uh campfires how you how you, fires and mm -hmm. and and uh and shades and the list and goes fans. on so, fans exactly fans air conditioning <laughs> car seats car seats car seats the the, the, the Oh, seat the heating warmers. car seat warmer. <laughs> yeah, seat warmer in your in your car. Yeah. Which I, I tell you, when our power went out last week, um, I was starting to think maybe I'd go out and start the car and just sit there. <laughs> I hear you. It was out for a long time. Oh no. Well, we, because of the wind, mm -hmm. right? Uh, probably. And when I say a long time, I mean. A few hours and well past the usual outage here. I don't mean days on end, which I know a lot of people have to deal with. So um. that's true. Well, so the first thing that I thought of when I started thinking about this was actually architecture, mm -hmm. um, because homes built in different parts of the world prioritize uh, different things. Prioritize different things mm -hmm. exactly. Um, And I mean, obviously, they're going to be different because of the materials available to build homes with. But at the same time, a lot of consideration goes into how will I be able to control the temperature? <laughs> so <clears throat> the really infamous version of this is that Japanese houses are all about surviving the hot weather. Mm -hmm. And so they're raised off of the ground to allow circulation underneath as well as up top. Mm. And, you know, all the walls are infamously made out of rice paper screens and things like that. Now, that's not true of all the exterior walls, but it is very true that uh, the Japanese house is definitely traditional. The traditional Japanese house that everybody thinks of is designed to catch whatever wind is there. Mm. Um, and it's not really designed for how are we going to stay warm? So the staying warm parts of that are um, you take a hot bath last thing before you go to bed mm -hmm. and you sleep under a nice uh, <clears throat> bit of insulation on your futon. And yep. during the day, you all huddle around a, um, a heated table with a quilt over it. So, um, you know, instead of insulating the entire house, you just restrict your, your heated area to small bits. Yep. And worry about your core temperature. <clears throat> and, um, you know, when I was a child, it was not, we weren't told, cover your head, cover your head. We were told, keep your belly warm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, different, different philosophies of temperature control there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in California, it's all about the insulation. Which has been true since, well, it's really interesting to me because I grew up in Southern California, which um, traditionally has that adobe history, but then um, a lot of the houses built uh, in the 20th century were not necessarily that well insulated other than, mm -hmm. say, our famous craftsmen's, which yeah. sort of are inspired by adobe. So I did not realize until I got to high school in Colorado that winter bathrooms don't have to be freezing cold. <laughs> I was shocked that you could get out of a shower and it would be warm in the bathroom because I thought they would all supposed to be icy. Um, hmm. Huh. Uh, I remember you know, finding bathrooms incredibly cold when I was living in Japan. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, uh, the idea that you could have like radiant heat or that you would have a towel warmer in the bathroom or that mm, yeah. you would even have a heater in the bathroom. All of this seemed incredibly exotic to me because as a child, all the bathrooms I ever went to, including my friend's houses, were all ice cold. Mm. Um, because 
a cold in at least coastal California is never um, life threatening as long as you have some kind of house. I mean, you could get exposure death and, and hypothermia if you're outside, but really, if you live in a in any kind of shelter, yes, it's going to get down to you know 40 degrees or whatever and it's not really great for you but we don't worry about bursting <laughs> pipes and we don't worry that people are going to need to be heated up after getting really seriously chilled outside so yeah we don't keep our places warm and when I moved to places that had snow and actually did acknowledge that people might get that chilled it was a revelation that you could be <laughs> warm inside yeah wow uh, you know because I definitely grew up with nose put on a sweater yeah <laughs> I well, never I got mean, cold enough to see our breath inside the apartment or the house, but yeah. Well, so here's here's the thing. It's it's it, a lot of it has to do with what you're accustomed to, right? So when I lived in a dorm in Tokyo, we had we had heaters in the rooms, which is you know to be expected. Um, and but you know I would use mine sometimes, right? And but then there were some people who had come from warmer climates who wanted to hang out in shorts. And so what they would do is they would like blast the heaters in their rooms, like nonstop and hang out in shorts. <laughs> and I would be like, okay, that would not be my approach, but, mm -hmm. but you do you, right? Because well, we talk in the other, we talk in the other direction too, you know, We're like, oh yeah, if those person, people come from a cool climate. And so they spend the entire summer in air conditioning. And they yep. blast it and they want to hang out in, you know, in, in, in warm clothes. Yep. We must, think... we must keep the air conditioning maintained so we can wear our three piece suit. Yeah. So, so that's part of it is what you, what you, what you wear. Um, because it does keep you, keep you, uh, keep your temperature up or down. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's that's an interesting. So you got combination. What you wear, uh, the building you're in, <laughs> mm -hmm. the climate, the so. climate. Um, hi. Hi, Hello. Hello. Welcome. I, I just arrived, obviously, but I'm going to dive into dive into world building, um, and hope I'm not repeating something said in the first few minutes, uh, which is. That uh, there's a couple things that you, what you all just said reminded me of. One is that if you've ever been to Israel, especially Jerusalem, you uh, were prone to see uh, the Haredi, the uh, Haredi, the the Jews in uh, basically dressed like 19th century Cossacks um, or Polish nobility, uh, depending. And they're all slightly different variations, but they're wearing heavy coats, black coats, heavy black furry hats in a hot <laughs> desert climate. Um, and they are uncompromising about this. When they're outside, that's what they're wearing. And so um, the other, uh, uh, hold on one moment. Girls, keep it down, please. Uh, on, on the other, uh, the other thing that I made me think about was how in the Raj and other places in the British Empire, wearing clothes appropriate for the climate of England was a marker of, of being the colonizer and maintaining civilization in the midst of what they considered not civilization, maintaining standards. Uh, it was a marker that you haven't gone native, right? If you'd actually dressed for the weather, you were starting to go native, which meant that your mind was suspect. Oh yeah. Compared to your other colonizers. <laughs> but yep. think about all of the energy that you have to devote to balancing the architecture and the clothing um, to go with the environment to maintain a comfortable body temperature. If you if you allow your clothing to match the the environment, the climate, and say, okay, well, if I wear either loose clothing that, that protects me from the heat or very little clothing, then the technology that I need to keep me at a comfortable within a comfortable range in this warm climate 
is minimal. I don't have to spend hours and hours and, and lots and lots of energy making and air conditioning so that I can wear the three piece suit that I spent all this time and energy <laughs> making, you know, for however, you, whatever path you take to get it. Mm -hmm. And how exactly is spending all of that time smarter than you're assuming not. that the pragmatic um, decision making is based on effort and practicality and and adaptation to climate as opposed to social you know alignment this, this thing yeah. about I mean, the thing is, you know, if you work in a bank, <clears throat> you, you cannot wear the clothes that you would wear to go to the beach, even if it's as hot or, hot or hotter than the beach inside the bank building, um, yep. because you have to be wearing all the signifiers. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it really is about in the culture, whatever culture you're writing or reading about, what is the important thing? And it's very, very often some kind of social signal. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And, and this is grooving off that. This is used in visual science fiction all the time. The moment where the character takes off the breathing mask or spacesuit and is suddenly in the environment in a way that that character wasn't before is always a significant moment in a visual yeah. science fiction story. And in fact, I would argue is an echo of going native. It has that. that, that <laughs> hmm. Um, it always astonished me that uh, Star Trek always somehow the air was always right for human breathing. Yeah, and that yeah. everybody can breathe the same air. Mm -hmm. Apparently, all of our blood is different, but we all need the same air mix. <laughs> A Vulcan has thin air. They made the Vulcans have green blood, and their air is thin. And, and McCoy had to give you know Kirk a shot so he could breathe in that air. Right. It's certainly a sedative, but in any case, that was was a reasonable thing to expect, right? Which, which show you is know, it that caused them encounter suits? Was that Fab Five? Yes. <laughs> the, the, the encounter suit, that is a brilliant example because the encounter suit is theater, right? The Vorlon is needed. Um, and then there's a, this is not really a spoiler since the show is, is over 20 years old, but there's a far future where a human is in a, a million years in the future in a, a human shaped encounter suit which is, again, shown to be pure theater. I don't want to talk so much about air, but because we're on the t topic of temperature, but they are related because spacesuits are not just for air. Right. Spacesuits have to protect you from the incredible cold of the vacuum of space, right? And the heat. Um, if and you're an heat, astronaut yeah. on, out doing a spacewalk, uh, mm -hmm. If half your suit is in shadow and half is in sunlight, the temperature differential is hundreds of degrees from one end of your body to the other. Mm -hmm. And the spacesuit has to be designed to to be able to to handle that. Yeah. Yep. But architecture is is um, I think very interesting uh, way of of handling things in modern architecture that is. Um, not as the 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 category of modern architecture, whatever that might be, but architecture of buildings constructed without considering environment. Um, so one of the interesting things about being in the upper Midwest is that um, it becomes very clear how much of these Victorian high ceilings and the um, upper when upper uh, tilting windows was all about uh, dealing with the heat mm. uh, in a pre-air conditioning age. Yeah. And um, how much you can tell that uh, ceiling fans made a difference once electricity became a thing. Right. And um, it's the newer buildings that have um, lower ceilings because the, um, it's just unbearable in the summer if you don't have adequate air conditioning and you have low ceilings. Right. Um, but they're, they're tiny little things that we don't always take into consideration. And um, it's becoming more and more interesting as the climate is changing what people are needing to adapt to because there are places that 
don't have any warm weather adaptations in their in their buildings and now they're they're with the record temperatures they're facing they're having a huge number of problems that <coughs> other places don't have i mean we make fun of the english for not putting ice in their drinks but um <laughs> You know, right. it's one way of maintaining your inter internal temperature and making sure that you're not actually overheating. <laughs> hmm. Yep. I would love to show you guys a picture of the MODS um, dorm, dorms uh, at my alma mater, hmm. uh, which is in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. And where it is cold and where people ski. And these buildings... Um, they're basically little apartments <clears throat> with wonderful high ceilings and you know well lit common room with gigantic glass windows. They are freezing cold, <laughs> you know. From well, the school yeah. year in in the Berkshires is uh, it's cold, or at least it was when you could predict the weather when I was in school. Yeah, but that's the kind of, of architecture you can look at and say that is really silly. Why did you put that here? <laughs> but the the only thing you can look at there and is to say, okay, those those angled roofs, yeah, are important in a place where it snows. Yeah, yeah. and um, I remember one time I was talking to a native Californian who uh, was I don't know had occasion to be somewhere other than California in the north with hills and was wondering why there weren't um, reflectors in the middle of the road all over like they are in California. And I said, because of snow plows. And they went, whoa, right? Blew their minds. Mm. Yeah, we have lots of bots dots. <clears throat> yeah. But I think in uh, in California, in, in the mountains where they do get snow, they just embed the reflectors into the into the uh road bed sometimes yes. yeah it all well, depends yeah. but we're used to in california they're used to bot stops which are actually textural yeah so um yeah speaking of of that kind of oh my goodness no there was the issue of um uh you there, Kat? Sorry, no matter how much prep I do, there's always demands. That's okay. <laughs> From small people. Um, so um, these giant whippy things on top of the fire hydrants, and I didn't know what they were. Oh, yeah. And, oh, right, if you have enough snow, you lose track of where your fire hydrants are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, Or on the edge of the road, too big long poles and also there are these giant long poles in, in like boston there are these these poles with these red lights on the top and i looked at them like why do you have red lights and people tried to tell me that it was a red light district and i'm like no you can't i don't believe that <laughs> um again <laughs> fire access um but apparently we segued off into a completely different topic sorry about that we should try well, that on what? a different That's episode great. so this this topic is really adjacent to a lot of other topics so you know, it's very easy to do. Um, I will mention that <laughs> when you're when you're world building, like when you're building a secondary world, right? Right. Um, you have a lot of elements of your world that are going to depend greatly on temperature control. Um, I would say, obviously, we've already touched on architecture and we've already touched on clothing a little bit, a little bit. Uh, food storage is really key and relies a great deal on temperature control because, you know, if you don't have the ability to cool something down, then you have to use other methods to keep it from going bad. That's really interesting. I don't think of that as temperature control as much as I think of that as like food preservation. Well, because there's, well, using temperature for food preservation is relatively modern yeah well actually no depends it depends because things like spring houses there's a yeah. certain amount that's available if you live in certain places that have access to things like mountain streams or 
if you are in a place of access to permanent frozen <coughs> ground or if you have access to ice um, and there are places where you can have access to even, even if it's not permafrost, digging into the soil, which tends to be colder, but uh, there are lots of places where that's entirely not yeah. a thing where, you know, all the desert environments, your food preservation tends to be based on, on drying things. Yeah. Or sealing them up in jars in some kind of spoilage retarding uh, solution. So. Yep. Um, I find that interesting is just uh, temperature control is not what comes to mind, even though as a walled world North American, that is, of course, <clears throat> the, the primary thing I do for food preservation is throwing things into various cold storage and that mm -hmm. um, anything else is sort of artisanal and, and fancy now. Oh, you can. Oh, you make pickles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you dry things. These are sort of... Labor intensive. These yes. are back to being old-fashioned and... Um, because they're old fashioned, they are luxury and and um, legacy activities as opposed to vital. Mm, yeah. Kind of like um, people in taking care of wool clothing. Mm. Um, it used to be just a matter of habit for people in much of Europe and things like that. Of course, your winter clothes are consists of things that need to be protected from from varmints the rest of the year when you're not wearing them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I grew up around mothballs. Now, how many people are really wearing a lot of wool? Some? Yeah. It depends on how traditional yeah. you are or whether or not you had a stash of wool on hand already and didn't see any reason to wear space age materials, but everybody else is wearing cheap polyester fluff. Or wool blends. Yeah, or blend. You'll see, you'll see uh, wool blends. You'll see uh, if you if you knit or crochet, if you work with yarn, you'll see wool blends. You'll see cotton blends. But you'll see even in the upper Midwest, when I go to stores, what I see being sold is acrylic and cotton sweaters, hmm. and not as many wool blends, which is surprising to me. But apparently, that's just it's what's cheap and easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wearing wool seems to be a thing for traditionalists and rich people. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the whole fur coat industry and how the social shift intersected with that wow. in of animals. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's interesting how much the coldest parts of the world are still on the, yeah, no, sorry, all of your high-tech materials aren't nearly as good as this you know, giant sheep that I did something to. It's it's very let's get inside the tauntaun. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We we were doing science fiction world building, right? Absolutely. Well I think that's still, you know, that's indicative, right? There's there's the intersection of technology and temperature right there. What I love is those chemical heat pack stickers that you have now. Those are amazing, and I, I don't know that my children think of them as amazing, but I remember when they were really novel. And those, yeah. those thin silver blankets that the emergency people we all re refer the to. The reflective blankets? Uh, as space blankets, yeah. They're yes. like really super thin, but they're super warm. Yeah. My and that's another high-tech kind of item. So yeah. I, I'm here with my prop, which I showed everybody before the show. So this is some kind of gel in a, in a plastic pouch. And I just learned today that you're not supposed to microwave it. I never have. I've never used them before. But there's some kind of metal disc in it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure why there's a metal disc in it, but uh, you're supposed to stick it in boiling water under constant stirring until it's warm enough. And then basically it's um, – this is a high-tech hot potato. <laughs> which is, uh, yeah. for those of us who read, you know, um, stories story set in the – Countryside, either in the English countryside or the American countryside, this is you know the traditional winter hand warmer, right? You stick a, a yeah. hot potato in your pocket. 
Um, <laughs> although I've also read older uh, European stories that featured bricks that you would put in. And we didn't even get into um, warming pans for beds. Warming pans. Uh, I saw those in Williamsburg, Virginia, as a kid, the bed warmers, these long poles where you put the hot coals in a, in a thing that went like that. And then you ran it under the sheets. And when I say you, I mean your servant did it for you. <laughs> right. If you were wealthy enough to, uh, and I remember being a kid and asking, well, who did it for the servants? And, you know, the answer was yeah. no one at all. <laughs> Well, you know, I I ran into somebody who used to call their um <clears throat> their their bed buddy on the road their bed warmer. So uh, that is not I've a modern that usage. A that is a that is a traditional term as well. Um, if you're rich enough or or charming enough, and then I I do not know enough about Mex um, pre columbian Mexican culture to know about this, but I have been told. That chihuahuas were bred to be bed warming um, <laughs> accessories for the nobility. Uh, you know, given the behavior of rich people in this century, I'm entirely willing to believe that that's possible. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Instead of huh. instead of wearing the fur coat, you just pile the puppies on, I guess. So um, Morgan's mentioning hypocausts. Because um, heated floors are really, really old technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you've got, and then you've got um, hot spring water. And Roman baths, which had like three different temperatures. You know, yeah. Different phases of the bathing, public bathing experience. Oh, and then there's the sauna followed by cold plunge uh, routine. That happens sometimes in Scandinavia. I believe it's Finland. And, and most famously in Finland, but there's a whole there's a whole banya and sauna culture all over the northern tier of Europe that we could devote an entire world building episode to bathing habits. Yes, absolutely. Because we have everything from the the Russian desire to whip yourself with various branches or <laughs> or aromatic leaves <laughs> and you hire someone to do this and you wear a wool a special wool hat i don't remember the name of it but it's an obligatory in the wool in the banya wool hat i it, it looks like heat stroke to me i don't know but i am a southern californian who does not understand what it's like to have the cold sink all the way into your bones yeah so um i don't i i I, I know this happens, and I know that this is why people want to do these things to themselves, and I'm not sure I can really believe it deep down. Um. <laughs> well, actually, you can have a whole conversation just if you ask what heat people keep their homes at. Well, there's, there's also the conversation about people and their beliefs about temperatures yeah. and, and what's plausible. And... Um, you know, I, I've lived in places with snow before, but not nearly as consistently as I have recently. And so I occasionally stare out the window and I'm like, oh, it's like being in a snow globe. And the people who've grown up in snowy places look at me like, oh, yes, that's very cute, dear. <laughs> <laughs> You're new to this, aren't you? <laughs> Which is that same look that I, I give to. Yes, you may make yourself a Nutella sandwich. Go away, please. <laughs> um. But, you know, it's that same look that I've given people when they're, they're freaking out about the, um, the brush fires in Southern California in, in, in the appropriate season. I'm like, no, this happens every year. And you have to know where all your insurance documents are and which photo albums you're going to carry with you and how to get your pets in to the car really quickly. And I don't know, it's just how, the way you do it. So <laughs> yeah, it's a question of what you get used to. Um, yeah. Also, what is a proper temperature of a bath is also a matter of, yes. of cultural differences. Or um, a shower, even. <laughs> I, I grew up in a culture of scalding bath water. And um, because clearly we had a lot of availability of, of water and heat. Yeah. And uh, seeing... I'm watching these uh, period dramas of what exactly you had to do in order to get a bath going. <laughs> and kettle after kettle of of water and I'm just gonna go oh man 
your bath was barely tepid, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's possible to say adapt <laughs> to. Um, hi. Hi, hi there. Hello. It's possible okay. to adapt quickly from one temperature to another. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure what I mean by quickly exactly, but during the summer, our living room can get into the, the low 90s mm. and be that way on days on end. And I don't like it, but I can learn to function in it. You yeah. are talking about low humidity 90s. That is very true. That is very true. It gets muggy and I, I can't function. But there was one summer when I had to go down to um, North Carolina and I stayed in a hotel and I walk in there and, and hotels tend to set their thermostats somewhere between 68 and 72, depending on, right. on a, don't know what, but I walk in there, it's 75, 76 degrees and I'm freezing. So I turned the AC down mm -hmm. uh, so that it's, the temperature is set at 80 something so that I can be comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's cooler than I am at home. But it's way warmer than most people would say should be comfortable because I'm not used to being that cool Yeah, in the summertime. Well, it's, it's that thing about, you know, the, the infamous moment on January 1st in Southern California where the tourists are all wearing shorts and the locals are all wearing parkas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And oh. I had a conversation. I had a conversation with a, a fellow California native uh, outside of California. We were both standing in the snow and they were contending that because they're a Californian, they don't wear heavy jackets and they were wearing a t-shirt and a cashmere sweater and a cotton hoodie. And I was just looking at them going, are you mad? And meanwhile, I was wearing a t-shirt and a down parka, a down knee length parka. And both <laughs> of us were insistent that this was about how, we in our native Californianness were were dealing with things, and I um, apparently it's because I I grew up around people who really 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 wanted to perform winter, and and uh, say look it's winter so therefore we need to wear the heavy coat and also this is how you justify your ski jacket or yeah, you're yeah, going yeah. to the snow jacket or you're <laughs> you know going up to the mountains jacket, and or you know we had a pretty stiff wind and things like that, but this other person had grown up on the coast and really, really, really one it was in the practice of performing that. Oh no, it's 70 degrees all year round. Yeah. Sort of California. And so that was uh, quite different. And then, you know, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the individual's level of circulation mm -hmm. and the sort of the level of the furnace. Because it's I don't also subcultural. Yes. But I don't think, for example, um, living in a different climate for years and years and years will cause you to change your fundamental um, body temperature, like, levels. Oh, no. I, I disagree. I, think, I disagree, yeah. having done it. Well, um, okay. All I know is that I have a friend who who moved to Japan as a child, like as a baby, and lived there for years and years and ne years, and then was like, I was never warm. <laughs> like, she never got used to it. So I guess it, it's a very individual thing. You maybe can adjust to it, or maybe not. The reason I say this is because as a Californian, if you ask me verbally, I will tell you that warm starts at about... 85 <laughs> hot does not start about till about 95 yeah unbearable is about 115 <laughs> i don't get I, I grew up in the san fernando valley and that cold starts at 50 yeah and that what the hell starts at 40 <laughs> oh, and it's above, 30, right that's what and you're at saying 30 you are saying there had better be skis on my feet <laughs> Now, this is not what I live in anymore. And, you know, the other day, it was all of 37 degrees or something. And I was like, woo, I'm going to go outside without my jacket on because 
you know, there'd been a long run of like 20 degrees. And so mm-hmm. all of a sudden, 10, 15 degrees hotter. It feels warm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, my Southern Californian self is kind of going, ah, you've adapted. I haven't really, though, because there are other things that I haven't adapted to. And yeah. meanwhile, man, humidity, it makes a difference. Yeah, it does. I hate it when it is 80 degrees and humid. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't. And so people ask me about where I'm living. They're like, oh, my God, the winters. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I want to run away every summer. Every summer I want to leave and not come back until the first snow. Mm-hmm. I don't mind it when it's snowing. I mind it like hell when it's hot. <laughs> yeah, that's Chicago, all right, because everyone has heating, but not everyone has air conditioning. And the summers I have one room fun. with air conditioning. I'm currently negotiating to buy one more from yeah. a friend that's portable yeah. because it's just unbearable i had a window unit yeah. and like we lived in that room in the summer yeah i don't like it i get claustrophobic and i get really cranky and i get cabin fever and it's like everybody else in the winter right okay but my children yeah. are like oh snow we can go outside and play yay and yeah a motorcyclist thing where motorcyclists will say there's no such thing as bad um bad weather only bad gear mm-hmm. now having oh, been in driving fat pelting rain with wind and it feeling like the raindrops were like actual mm-hmm. pebbles or something hitting my skin. I do not recommend this method of motorcycling, especially because visibility gets low when you do this and traction becomes yeah, a problem. It's low. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. you know, people do have these attitudes about what can you survive? Well, if, as long as you have the right clothing and, you know, I keep getting cold every summer. Well, you know, you can have the ice field bandana and you can have the hat with a fan. I'm, I'm sorry, the hat with a fan is completely, it's too dorky for words for me. <laughs> I, it's one of those places where I, my, I claim I have no sense of dignity, but apparently that's that line for me. <laughs> Not going to wear the hat with a fan in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That one's not for so, me either. <laughs> so yeah no so my summer companion now is one of these oh yeah fans uh the, these are like a buck 50 from chinatown right so and all look of- shiny <laughs> yeah, the other thing it's the other thing gritty. that that i have noticed is a um a habit for hot weather that's humid is having a little um face mop with you mm-hmm. <clears throat> Also, also cultural, what temperature beverages do you drink? Mm, yeah. Well, you know, okay. my grandmother's so hot- generation drank hot tea all year round. Yeah. I would drink hot tea in the summer, but not for temperature reasons. For If I'm drinking hot tea in the summer, it's because I'm sick or mm. I'm unhappy. It's a comfort food. Yeah, I we're talking winter because it's comfort food and hot. But there are all these folk beliefs about the harm of ice drinks. Huh. There are people who live in very, very hot places who swear that ice drinks are bad for you. Yes, I have heard this. And also, the first time I came to Chicago when I was in my early 20s, I was a Californian who was used to frozen booze we really love our frozen Mm. margaritas in southern california at least at the time and there wasn't a bar in chicago that had a blender Hmm. it was it was astonishing to me that you could only get your drinks on the rocks yeah i'd never had a margarita over ice until i got here i'd only had them blended until now and it was it was just astonishing to me that this was a thing and again, you know, I, I've grown up with a lot of cold drink <clears throat> culture. And my children feel themselves very deprived when they're not getting boba tea on a regular basis. So, yeah. But some cultures swear that that's, that's not the right thing to do. So uh, a couple, couple things. Uh, you were showing the fan earlier. Uh, in cultures that have fans, of course, there are other uses right like what the fan indicates the social cues that you could use a fan uh, for yeah. uh, it's, which it's arose the, uh, out of the the temperature need right yes 
there's a, a subtle communication of fans. Um, I I don't know what the Japanese and Chinese traditions of this are. I because I've only read about it from sort of that Victorian and Edwardian um, comedies and matters sorts of things of you know various fans and like you know old ladies wrapping people with their <laughs> fans. You know, <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, people going to other places and, and getting cranky about whether or not there's ice in their drinks. Americans are notorious abroad for being, where's the ice in my drink? Yeah. yeah. And I have European friends who complain bitterly that they have to really, really, really work hard at telling American service personnel that no, they don't want ice in their drinks because service people in the U.S. are like, y- you what? <laughs> Yeah, what I have I I that too, actually. <laughs> but not because I'm not American. <laughs> it's because I have Are you sure? <laughs> teeth. <laughs> so, well, I don't know. Yeah. Well, something has changed recently that I'm not aware of. Um, there's also what temperature did your food come out at? Yes. Sure. Um, and, you know, it's, it's again one of those colonizer things of, of no, no, we must have our food piping hot. Yeah. Or or about the the power and the wealth of showing off your your iced food. Yeah. It's all very interesting. So, I want to uh, get back to something we we just kind of transitioned and I I wanted to interject. Sure, re- um, revisit. Go ahead. The uh when we're talking about um what is comfortable as personal body temperature, especially like in Chicago, I I'm talking. Especially on uh, Talia, leave her alone. Um, especially on, uh, you know, like the difference between the beginning of winter, 40 degrees in Chicago, and the end of winter when you're like shorts of a t-shirt because it's 40 degrees. Um, there's a wonderful bit of world building. There was a Michael Moorcock, more or less standalone novel called The Ice Schooner, in which it was a frozen planet, and there are these um, giant like ice skates, these ships chasing ice whales, which lumbered along on top of the ice. And uh, at one point, he just drops this one sentence in where he says everyone had stripped to uh, to their stripped their shirts off because the temperature had gone above zero degrees Fahrenheit. And then the novel moves on and makes you realize how adapted the humans were to the cold environment, that that was mm-hmm. a part of the world building. He just casually threw it in there. But I remember it like it must have been 30 years since I read that book. Um, you know, it stuck with me. Is such an a, like an amazing moment of casual world building. Yeah, we do. I, I encounter a whole lot of world building in secondary worlds where uh, the author has forgotten to think about temperatures because yes. apparently they're temperate climate people who always assume there's perfect air conditioning and heating everywhere. Yeah. And so nobody goes outside and gets chilled. Nobody goes outside and gets heat stroke. And nothing ever happens that's temperature based to anybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm actually sort of my, my work in progress. I'm, I settled on the 1930s depression and I'm sort of making a point of talking about like the temperatures and I have no idea why. I just, because there was like no air conditioning. So I'm just thinking about this, like, like what is this late summer seaside town? Um, so, yeah, so that's actually, weirdly enough, one of the things I don't forget about. <laughs> yeah. I grew up in a Southern California full of swimming pools and ice cream. Yeah. And blended smoothie drinks. And I've been listening. Uh, in, in One of my hot weather comfort um, activities is to listen to Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights. <laughs> okay. Which is discussing um, a, a summer day in Spanish Harlem and... You know, you really get a feeling for how precious the Piragua man's wares are when it's that hot. Mm. Where he has this, these, these um, ice, basically um, Dominican popsicles and, mm-hmm. you know, um, shave, shaved ice and all these other things where, boy, um, lack of refrigeration and lack of freezing just really really makes a difference I lived on a boat for a long time where 
we the first year I lived on the boat, we didn't have air conditioning. The second year, we decided that we were going to take advantage of the generator and get an air conditioner aboard the boat. And we would hunker down in the one room. And it was both luxurious and really creepy to be in this environment where we were just sort of sequestered like that. Mm. Um, because, of course, when you're living in that environment, you are much more conscious of exactly how much the outside temperature is affecting you. I yeah. can currently live in a world of thermostats where I have no idea what the outside temperature is unless I want to go out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it is rather like living in a spaceship in that yeah. particular sense, except lots, that lots of places in the Midwest have those tubes like, um, you know, that go from building to building. The snow. The oh, the snow yes. Yeah. The snow and bridges. so, yeah. like, I would go to Gen Con when it was in downtown Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew why there were tubes between the buildings in downtown Milwaukee. But the people from the south had no idea why there were tubes connecting buildings. Right? Because it was August. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, you know, if you're in the right places in August, the tubes are nice because they're air conditioned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is also the case. Um, yeah, I, I really do not like humid hot. So I, I was going to say, haven't... um, sorry, Morgan. I, a thing that, that we haven't looked at is body type, and body shape mm. Mm. that affects how different people might feel different levels of comfort in temperature. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, and then of course there's there's things like your joints. If you have your joints are getting older or uh, less than wonderfully functional, even if you're young, you're going to be your joints might be happier with the heat, even if you aren't. Mm -hmm. Which is one reason um, we keep our house warmer now than we used to. Is my joints are not happy with the the cold temperatures. I can deal with it a few t few degrees cooler. Yeah, I'd be happy to get used to it if my body would work as well as it used to. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Well, I mean, here we are. It's five o'clock already. <laughs> um, Time flies when you're having fun. So um, thank you all for, for joining us for this topic. Uh, this has been interesting, and I'm still kind of thinking. <laughs> thinking. <laughs> um, oh, can, I, can I add one more thought? Yeah. Uh, which is science fiction written about planets like Venus, where it's, you know, 700 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, but there's room temperature, you know, up in the sky, right? So if yeah. you want to, if you want to, colonize venus the, the there's one atmosphere of pressure and room temperature at a certain height above the planet sulfuric acid clouds but other than that you know it's, it's nice right so, yeah it's a lot easier than colonizing the surface yeah well my um the uh people on in in my uh varan world are typically um living underground and so it's always the same temperature for them um and so the people who have to go up on the surface are actually um the only people who are aware of the fact that temperature is a thing that changes so in the first novel by scott sigler they go miles underground and they have to have it gets hot miles underground on earth and they have to put on special suits. Yeah. I, I was, you know, it, it is, I kind of knew about ground freezing because I'd read stories about not being able to bury people in the winter. Yeah, oh yeah. But I didn't really understand frozen ground until I lived around it. Because mm -hmm. what do you mean the ground is a thing? But I've also encountered people who would get to someplace like Southern California and be very, very startled that uh our earth would get so parched yeah in the summertime and that it's actually you know very cracked and and cr like like baked clay and then of and course in the winter it becomes very really really gloopy <laughs> yeah i think i actually associate summer as a season of hard shoveling so mm. um mm. i've been playing terraforming mars and really thinking about <laughs> 
what it takes to get uh, an environment to be human happy. Yeah. So technology, it's all technology, whether it's, it's electricity <clears throat> and, and silicone or, and silicon or, or just, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. messing with it, palm fronds or, or wood or coal or whatever it is. I think you're right. The, the most, one of the earliest forms of, of humans in tech has to be temperature control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Starting with fire. I don't know. Fire and, and ice. Fire, yeah. Fire and fur. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's a, I, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to argue that that's a thing that Europeans up in the cold are really concerned with. And that if you are living down in more temperate climates, your first instinct is not, do I need fire for warmth? No. In more tropical never... zones. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, I need protection from the sun. Yeah. And where can I go to be cool? And so you see this um, thing in, in Hawaii where the, um, the colonizers all want to live by the beach. Yeah. And the Kama'aina, all, all the, the uh, Hawaiians all want to live up in the mountains where it's cooler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And further away from tsunami and all those other things. So there's a real difference in, in cultural assignment of, of um, high value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have all these snowbirds who come in and they just really want to be warm. And again, I, having grown up in a place where you don't have to build yourself a sauna, you can just open up your car in the middle of the summer to get that blast furnace feeling. Um, <laughs> it's taken me a very long time to learn that I, that to tolerate being in this, this intensely hot environment that my friends prize. And the Russians I know, even if they've been living in Miami for 30 years, still have, the ones who grew up in Russia still have this deep, deep craving for being in an environment that will bake the heat into your bones. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I love it, and I don't use it nearly enough, and I do. It's, it's, it's there is something very comforting about roasting. Um, well, I, I would rather have a meeting in a meat locker. <laughs> <laughs> My mom uh, grew up on the East Coast and um, then moved out to coastal Northern California. Um, and, and she was so happy when they moved to Chicago because she could finally be warm. <laughs> like in the summertime. Oh, man. Because in our area, we had oh. foggy summers. So. Midsummer days in San Francisco at Fourth and Market Street, where the where those straight straight line streets form a wind tunnel, and it's just <laughs> it's sixty five degrees, and it really does feel like ice. <laughs> well, on that note, I'm going to have to wrap up here. Thank you all for for being here. Um, next week we are still on for Tuesday afternoon. Um, I'm thinking that we should do personal weapons next week. Hmm. Um, hmm. So um, let's talk about that. And I am uh, happy to happy to be still able to do this. So so Yay. far, so good. Yay. <laughs> and uh, I will stop the broadcast. <laughs>